the Juneau World Affairs Council, and the University of Alaska Southeast, in collaboration with KTOO, present the 2019 World Affairs Forum, Modern Journalism, the Role of News Media in a Changing World. In this lecture, Gloom and Doom, the Media's Role in Public Disengagement on Climate Change, journalist and University of Alaska Anchorage professor Elizabeth Arnold argues that the national media's narrow narrative would be more balanced with reporting that includes innovative responses to change, adaptation, and resilience. Okay, make sure this is all working. Can everybody hear me? I am in radio, so we gotta make sure that's... And you know, I just wanna start off by saying something that not many people know, and I'm probably not supposed to say, but as my first um, act that I care deeply about as chair of the department, which I became because I was gone for a semester and I missed the meeting. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> you all be pleased to hear this. Um, our next Atwood chair is Larry Persley. Oh. Hey. And I really. <laughs> right. No, I couldn't be more happy about it, and the students, boy, they've got something coming for sure. Uh, thank you, Juneau World Affairs Council and University of Alaska Southeast for having me. Um, first off, I am, in, I am from and in, still in radio, and I'm also a little shy. Um, I tried this at a TED Talk in Seattle, and it worked, worked really well. If you could just all close your eyes for the rest of my talk, <laughs> I would really be at ease. Um, as some of you know, I have spent a little bit of time here years ago, um, and when I wasn't playing in a band at uh, the Red Dog, the way better Red Dog back in the day, um, I did have a job here as a reporter at KTOO. But to get that job, um, I was told during my brief interview, um, I had to submit a writing sample, of course. And um, the problem was I was living on a boat in Ock Bay, and I had no access to a typewriter because I'm dating myself here, I need a typewriter. <laughs> and I went back to the boat that afternoon, I kind of sulked and I went to bed and the next morning I woke up and this huge boat in the harbor had sunk. It had like a cement hull, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but yeah. So I had my story, I got some quotes um, and I didn't know what to do. So I walked up to what was then UAJ, um, went to the library, they had typewriters. Typed it up, went to K2, got the job. So thank you again, University of Alaska Southeast. <laughs> and thank you, K2, and thank you, Juno, for taking a chance on me. Um, and if you'll indulge me to reminisce just a little bit more, um, as you all know, it was just the anniversary of the Exxon Valdez. It's been 30 years, wow, which also dates me. Um, and 30 years ago this month, NPR took a chance on me. Um, at the suggestion of my boss at the time, Bill Legere, who's still the boss, I believe. Yep, still there. Um, I applied and was chosen for this residency or kind of a fellowship of, of sorts at, at NPR in Washington, D.C., where they bring you to see how the other half lives. Um, the day I arrived, the Exxon Valdez slammed into Bly Reef. And I was supposed to go straight to NPR headquarters and work the overnight shift for morning edition. And I walked in the door and I heard Carl Castle reading a newscast um, saying the spill had occurred near a remote, uninhabited place called Valdez. <laughs> <laughs> now, I love Carl, I really do. Um, but I set him straight on both accounts there. And they put me to work that night writing news spots. And all I really wanted to do was go home um, and cover the story. But NPR kind of convinced me that I would be more of use to them in DC. So I stayed, and the very next day, I was sent to the White House. And uh, this was during uh, Iran-Contra. And um, there had been some big news, I believe that day, I think it was about Poindexter, um, if you can remember that far back. Um, and I found the NPR seat in the White House briefing room, and President Bush, the senior President Bush, um, walked in, flanked uh, by Senator Stevens and Senator Murkowski, and um, my heart was beating. And uh, immediately, two reporters at the front of the room, uh, Sam Donaldson and Andrea Mitchell, started shouting questions. And everybody else started shouting questions. They were all questions about Iran-Contra. And I'm in the back, way back where NPR's seat is, and I was like, <laughs> you know, because this is, 
this is my story. This is like my home. This is my beaches and my people. You know, I, I really felt strongly about this. And so I, I started yelling, shouting questions and miracle of miracles. The president must have heard some of a part of what I was yelling about. And that's, of course, what he was supposed to be talking about. Um, and he called on me uh, because I was the only one in the briefing room who didn't want to ask him about Iran-Contra. <laughs> Nevertheless, my colleagues in the press weren't that happy with me. <laughs> they weren't my colleagues at the time. Uh, but anyway, that was sort of my start as a national reporter, and it was trial by fire. I spent the rest of the month back and forth between the White House and Congress covering the hearings, Coast Guard hearings, oil response briefings, and that kind of stuff. And um, long story short, ended up as the political correspondent, blah, blah, blah. And uh, way too many presidential campaigns later, I came home to Alaska, and um, now I'm teaching future journalists at UAA. And I love it. I really do. I love teaching. I don't like administration stuff, uh, but I do love to teach. Um, most of you were here earlier today to hear, hear all the great speakers. Um, I'm not a fan of media bashing um, or news consumer bashing. Um, understandably, I'm a journalist, a practitioner, um, and we're the messenger for sure, and we get beat up because of that all the time, but we're definitely not at the root of every problem. Um, but this is what I'm going to talk about a little bit tonight, um, introspection, navel gazing, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And last spring, I was fortunate enough to be chosen as a fellow at Harvard's uh, Shorenstein Center. Uh, where I had the opportunity, and I was told that I had to do this, um, to reflect on my profession, uh, and in particular how we in the media are doing when it comes to covering the topic of climate change. Um, and this was partly my doing, but um, I wanted to focus it especially on um, the part of the world that I'm most familiar with, which is uh, here and well north of here in the Arctic. And I've lived uh, in Alaska, I just figured this out now, uh, for more than half my life, um, which means nothing here, I know that. Um, so like I'm a half lifelong Alaskan, right? Half lifelong Alaskan, which means I, I don't have the right to have an opinion about anything <laughs> yet, <laughs> right? Um, I've been fortunate enough in my career to um, have been to the North Pole twice, uh, 10 years apart, and that was extraordinary for me. Um, and to have been on U.S. and Russian and Canadian icebreakers in the Bering, Chukchi, Beaufort, and East Siberian Seas. So I have a, a fairly good idea about uh, how much this part of the world, the Arctic, is changing. Um, and as most of you are probably aware, for the second year in a row, uh, sea ice extent, I don't know how many um, people follow all this, um, in the Bering Sea, though, is at an historic low. Um, it's been well documented in the news, and I saw an interesting, well-meaning tweet about it. Um, it's something like, um, scientists have never observed so little ice in the Bering Sea in the spring, um, so sound the alarm, bang your pots and pans. And it made me think about this research that I did um, last spring, um, which was about the fact that we journalists, along with scientists, we have been banging pots and pans and sounding the alarm. Um, and apparently it hasn't been enough. So um, before I get too far into this, let me be very clear for any of you activists in the room. I do believe that it is critical to talk about the impact of climate change in the Arctic and worldwide. But I also believe um, we haven't been telling the whole story. Um, there's a huge and growing body of academic research about this, and that's what I learned when I was at Harvard. Um, and it's what I was interested in looking at further, uh, looking at news specifically about the Arctic and even more specifically the stories that are out there that have a human face. So I want to back up a little bit to explain the genesis of this. Uh, in 2008, um, as an NPR correspondent, I came back to Alaska and I reported on what was happening in New Talk. Most of you probably know about New Talk, right? Um, they were losing 40 to 100 feet of land a year to erosion, sinking, blah, 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 flooding, threatening homes. Um, and I chose to report on New Talk back then because the community was actually working on a relocation plan after voting to move to higher, more stable ground. 
and my story compared what was happening in the actions of New Talk with Kivalina, because at the time Kivalina was facing similar conditions um, and had filed suit that year against ExxonMobil for damages caused by climate change. So it was a different way to go. Um, the suit was eventually dismissed. Uh, let's see if this works. So over the last 10 years, since 2008, since that uh, report aired on NPR, uh, as a lot of you probably know, news outlets from all over the world have visited New Talk, Kivalina, Shishmaref, Shaktulik, and a dozen other Alaska Native communities thinking about relocation because of the effects of, of climate change. And these national stories um, largely fit the same narrative pattern, with images of houses tipping precariously off cliffs, and phrases like impending doom, cultural extinction, the reporting paints a picture of tragedy, hopelessness, and they frame community members as victims to sell the urgency of mitigation to the public. Uh, as one CNN correspondent unabashedly reported, a trip here is like a trip into a disturbing future. And this image, this is a house in Shishmar, I'm sure you've all seen it, um, was shot by an AP photographer. It, um, it's been in the New York Times, the New York Daily News, the Financial Tribune, Der Spiegel, Esquire, The Guardian, Mother Jones, ABC, CBS, CNN, PBS NewsHour, NPR Bill Moyers, Huffington Post, Vox, among others. I mean, I could be here all night. And the repetition of this narrow narrative in national and international media for more than 10 years hasn't really resulted in a groundswell of support for mitigation or adaptation or much in the way of funding for relocation. Um, it hasn't really resulted in any major public policy at the state or federal level. And you could argue that it may have even undermined the ability of some of these coastal communities to help themselves. Another caveat, I'm talking about national reporting. Local and hyperlocal journalism has done a much better job of reporting the whole story of these communities um, and their efforts to respond um, and a shout out, if I may, to Alaska Public Radio and the uh, Energy Desk, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Um, we all know the Arctic's warming two to three times faster than anywhere else on the planet, blah, blah, blah. Uh, for Americans, a lot of people don't know this, for Americans, the Arctic is Alaska. Um, when I ask students sometimes, you know, I mean, they, you know, I'm like, what? So, they, they don't where snow and sea ice have been declining rapidly, um, and these coastal villages have no buffer from the storms, and it's compounded by melting permafrost and erosion and all of that. And while it's important for the public to see and understand this threat, it's also important for the public to see and understand how people are responding. And that's what I really wanted to take a look at. Um, Anthony Lazarowitz, is the director of a program at Yale on climate change communication, which does some great work. There are so many people out there who are so smart about this stuff. It's scary how many people study what the media does and how many people study what the media is doing on climate change, and they never talk, we don't talk to each other. There's no intersection there. Um, so uh, the Yale Center, they do all kinds of research um, on psychological, cultural, political factors that influence attitudes and behavior toward climate change. And um, Anthony's best known for his research about the six Americas. If you pay any attention to climate stuff, you'd know what that is. Categories of public opinion about climate change on a scale from dismissive uh, to alarmed. And he and others say that because the media has focused disproportionately on impact, Americans are just tuning out. In the case of New Talk, the national journalists, they come in, they've already got their story written, they want to do a story about climate victims, climate refugees, they tell that story, and they're out. And what's increasingly more important, and a more complex story, a little harder to do, requires follow-up too, is how New Talk, Kivalina, and other communities are responding. And this is just one case. This is, I mean, you can apply this across the board to lots of climate change reporting, um, all over the world, actually. So the underlying premise of the paper I worked on in my talk tonight is that this repetition of this narrative that focus, focuses exclusively on the impact of climate change leaves the public with this overall sense of powerlessness. 
And I looked at five years of national media coverage of climate change in the US Arctic, specifically stories about communities facing coastal erosion and relocation. And man, does Harvard have some great libraries and resources to do that. Um, and argued for journalism that provides a more representative view, reporting that includes responses and innovations and increases pressure on policymakers, policymakers to act rather than providing excuses for inaction. Um, the importance of narrative in telling the climate change story can't be underestimated. Many Americans haven't experienced the effects of climate change personally. Most, however, have already formed some kind of opinion about it. And climate change didn't come into worldwide consciousness through local experience. It came through us, through reporters, through public discourse, the press. Um, listen to this mention of climate change uh, in the Christian Science Monitor um, by Robert Cohen. It was called, Are Men Changing the Earth's Weather? Quote, industrial activity is flooding the air with carbon dioxide gas. This gas acts like the glass in a greenhouse. It's changing the Earth's heat balance. It could bring anything from an ice age to a tropical epoch. Every time you start a car, light a fire, or turn on a furnace, you're joining the greatest weather experiment men have ever launched. You're adding your bit to the tons of carbon dioxide sent constantly into the air as coal, oil, and wood are burned at unprecedented rates. That sounds like something Bill McKibben would like tweet, right? <laughs> that was written in 1957 in the Christian Science Monitor. So reporting the science journalists were already establishing the concept of human-caused climate change in the public mind. And over the past several decades, as media coverage of climate change has grown, so it has research of the coverage that I was talking to. In fact, I think there's a lot more people studying us, what we do, writing about climate change than there are us writing about climate change. Um, there's a guy, uh, there, well, there's two guys, Jules and Max Boykoff, and they are climate and media researchers. And they did an analysis of four major American newspapers between 88 and 2002 and concluded that journalists, by relying on their traditional norm of balance, had introduced a false equivalence into the narrative and coverage. So what's known as false balance, balance is bias. Um, it's the practice of adding a contrarian view from an organization skeptical of climate change, for example, the Heartland Institute, to balance the view of a scientific organization like the IPCC. Um, I Honestly, I remember myself being asked to include another viewpoint in early reporting about the findings of the IPCC, and I was Okay, who is that? And you know, it's American Petroleum Institute. You had to balance. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. Um, another look seven years later found that the same news organizations had somewhat self-corrected. And at the time, Boykoff then called attention to a new trend of what he said was daily fear, misery, and doom headlines and articles and said, while dramatic and fearful representations can successfully raise awareness and concern about climate change. These kinds of images were also likely to distance or disengage individuals, tending them to render them feeling helpless and overwhelmed. Boykoff is currently director of, a, uh, it's called the Center for Science and Technology at the University of Colorado Boulder, and they created a media and climate change observatory, and it keeps daily track of climate change stories in 38 countries. It's a really cool, interesting resource. I'm hoping I'm not getting too wonky here. If I do, just you know, raise your hand, like do a W, like too wonky, Arnold. <laughs> um, anyway, it's pretty interesting, and uh, this is a screenshot from their website. And he uh, recently, uh, in a conversation, said there is still, he believes, a very a pervasive doom and gloom narrative and stories about climate change because there's just no entry points, there's no way to engage, there's no sense that people can do much to affect change. Okay, so it might seem, especially journalists in the audience, uh, contradictory to provide information about mitigation or adaptation in a story about climate change impacts. But if you think about it, it's standard procedure in the coverage of public health. It, what reporter covering a flu epidemic wouldn't think to provide information in the same story or a sidebar about the availability of a vaccine or how the disease was being transmitted? You're not telling you not telling people to get the vaccine. 
Um, so I wanted to look at this further, and I talked to this woman, Lauren Feldman, at George Mason, another center for climate change communication. Um, and she says, unlike public health, stories about climate change don't discuss, seldom discuss, both threat and efficacy information or impact and action. And in a study that she did uh, of US network television news between 2005 and 11, she found that impact and efficacy were rarely discussed together in the same broadcast. But to the extent that efficacy was discussed at all, it was framed in terms of conflict. So a fight between political parties or the impossibility or downside of a potential remedy. And her most consistent finding is that um, including that, including solution information or efficacy, increases people's sense of hope. And of all the emotions, fear, anger, hope, hope is the most consistent driver of intentions to engage. We journalists most likely fail to tell the solution part of the story on any real consistent basis because A, maybe it's not as dramatic, but B, it kind of smacks of advocacy. There's no real convergence yet over solutions. There's consensus around the science. It's growing. Um, but if you pair the science with what an individual can do about it, it looks like you're making an argument for a specific action, picking a winner. So it gets left out. Um, and Feldman's research says, if it's left out, people tune out. Um, a lot of these findings aren't that new. Yale, uh, Yale Lazarowitz, Anthony, he dubbed this uh, a while ago, um, uh, the hope gap. And in his Six Americas study, um, as I said earlier, he divided Americans into six groups, uh, dismissive, doubtful, disengaged, cautious, concerned, and alarmed, and found that even the alarmed, the most concerned about climate change, were not likely to know what to do, how to respond. So we shape narratives on climate change, and we do so by choosing the importance of one storyline over another. I teach journalism. It's a, you know, I teach the, the, the story arc and all of that. Um, and the classic story arc is in the shape of a U. A man falls into a hole, and he figures a way out. He gets up and out of the hole, so it's a U. And that's encouraging, because after all, the, mo the man climbed up and out. And the story's not encouraging if he just falls into the hole. <laughs> right? But most climate change reporting is the story of falling into an, an inescapable hole. We're not, we're not showing a way out or a potential way out. Um, over the last couple decades, national and international media outlets have spent a lot of time up here and spent a lot of money sending correspondents to remote communities in the Arctic, like New Talk, to witness and report on the human impacts of climate change. Um, anthropologists uh, from Alaska, actually, Elizabeth Marino and Peter Schweitzer noted in 2016, rural Alaska has been besieged with unprecedented numbers of journalists, photographers, scientists, and politicians, all eager to engage in a discussion, or even better, get a photo of people who have firsthand experience with climate change. And they themselves were documenting the impacts of climate change in Shishmaref, and while they were there, they reported that while we were making dinner with a Shishmaref resident who had already been featured in a Canadian documentary about climate change and had been quoted and photographed for People and Time magazines, two television crews, one from Japan and one from Colorado, were simultaneously filming a story on climate change in the kitchen. <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> uh, the shape of the narrative begins in the early stages of the reporting process, as most journalists know, in, in the very questions that you choose to ask. Somebody asked a question about that in an earlier session. Um, for example, how does it feel to be a climate victim? What's it like to know that you might lose your home in the middle of the night? These are questions. I mean, I've pulled these from interviews. Um, are you afraid of losing your culture? Just how bad are the storms? How does it feel to know there's nothing you can do to stop it? These are quotes questions from journalists. Um, I don't know if anybody knows Sally Russell Cox, but she's the community planner for the state of Alaska who has been working with New Talk since 2006. She is tireless. She says she rolls her eyes when she gets another email from a media organization 
asking for the contact information to go out to New Talk. She just wants to say, look, have you looked at how many times the story has been told? You know, what what are you, you know, what 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 are you, what's your goal here? And she says it's usually always the same story, and it's definitely not the whole story. Um, to determine the narrative of the dominant story of climate change, I did an actual with some help of a research assistant who was so much smarter than I was, and she was, uh, you know, what, 22 or something. Um, we did this analysis of stories containing the key terms climate change and Arctic in prominent print, radio, and television news outlets over this five-year period um, before and after Obama's visit here, right when the U.S. assumed chairmanship of the, of the Arctic Council. And I won't bore you with the numbers, but the analysis establishes that most news stories over that time period, not surprisingly, focused on the science of climate change with no human subject. Um, and when the news stories did include people's voices, they were overwhelmingly experts, scientists, policymakers. And few actually did include the voice of actual residents. But of the minority subset of stories that did have a human subject at the center of the narrative, um, it was that of an indigenous person or community, not surprising. And of that subset, the individual or community was framed overwhelmingly as a victim facing environmental threat. And the stories framed communities as threatened, endangered, entirely incapable of responding. Um, none of them used the words, we did a big word search like strong, capable, empowered, any of those words to describe the people. In fact, the word strong appeared only to describe the forces of climate change, as in strong storms or opposition to solutions such as strong resistance in Congress. Um, visually, most of the stories, television and print stories, use wide aerial shots along with like eroding beaches and cracks in the tundra. You've seen these uh, to convey the vulnerability of the communities. Raising the question from folks in the lower 48, why people would ever choose to live in such a place, a question that was seldom answered in these stories. And as I'm sure all of you are well aware, it's important to note that New Talk, Kivalina, and some of these communities in Alaska that are most at risk um, were actually required to settle there. Um, schools were built where barges could offload construction materials on sand spits and barrier islands, river deltas. Um, I remember Lucy Adams in Kivalina saying that uh, she had traveled by skin boat 70 miles to where she lives now from Point Hope to Kivalina. Um, because that's where the school was. Uh, so a qualitative examination, I've learned these words, a qualitative examination of national media coverage uh, revealed pretty much the same thing. Um, the traditional broadcast networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, along with Vice, Al Jazeera, The Guardian, they would begin with the somber music beds and images of the waves and the sandbags and, you know, the eroding bluffs. Um, and the aerial shots to illustrate isolation. Um, most of the paper, most of the print stories followed a similar structure with text and images, you know, to set the scene of environmental disaster. Um, the community, these are quotes, the community is described as being erased, swallowed up, swept away, washed away, in the process of disintegrating, vanishing, disappearing, one bad storm away from being wiped off the map to the point where it will be lost to the sea and cease to exist. How would you feel if someone came to your town and said that you, your town was going to cease to exist? I mean, you're already thinking about moving up the road. Does your town cease to exist? The substance of the story is pretty much emotional description of the problem. How the community is responding is usually an afterthought. If the story does include a discussion of responses, it's usually framed as an obstacle, the inability to get funding, the inadequacy of retaining walls that have been funded so far, uh, what would be lost, the community moves, and cost. Most repeat the huge, high, impossibly high costs calculated by the core government agencies, $400 million to relocate 400 million people, begging the question, um, that's never really answered. Um, and in the few more comprehensive reports about New Talk specifically, the community that's closest toward relocation, um, McTarvick in their new housing site, it's mentioned in the context of how little progress has been made. A few buildings that have been erected and the difficulty of getting construction materials and, you know, problems along the way. And finally, most of these reports end with a further message of impending doom, leading the audience deep in the hole with little hope of climbing out. Quote, he knows the time is coming when all this can be lost. Quote, 
a ruined world, and the Inuit are facing it right now. This Vice News report, uh, Climate Change is Killing This Alaska Village, ends with uh, the relocation coordinator, Romy Cadiente, who's pretty well known for his relentless optimism, close to tears as he's asked live on camera, it's going to take millions of dollars to move new talk. Why should the money be spent moving a couple hundred people? So, I mean, that's not a shocker to most of you, um, but there really is little, if anything, in everything I, I looked and scoured, um, national news reports about resilience that Yupik and Yupik people have lived in the region for thousands of years, weathering and adopting and adapting to wrenching environmental and cultural change. It doesn't fit the narrative, but leaving it out ignores history. Um, I don't know if anybody knows Henry Huntington. He's a pretty well-known Arctic uh, social scientist, and, and he, he says, um, if people in the Arctic weren't good at making the best of what they encounter, there wouldn't be people in the Arctic. Um, Huntington, he's studied uh, human environment interactions in Alaska, Canada, and Greenland for a long time, and um, he too says that coverage of the human impact of climate change not only provides a distorted view of these communities, he said, I don't see how it can't distort your perception of yourself and your community too. It perpetuates the idea of being a victim if all we want to know from you is whose house is next to a road into the sea. Um, and we in the media aren't the only culprits. Huntington and colleagues are looking at a, a similar focus in scientific research um, that life in the Arctic is being studied solely through this lens of climate change. Um, and he's kind of making the case that research should be broadened to include a lot of other things that are happening in these communities. Um, I was just talking with uh, someone from the anthropology um, world, and uh, I, I discovered that you know, there's all these anthropologists going into these communities um, to talk to people about how they're feeling about um, erosion and climate change. And now there's a whole nother wave of anthropologists who are coming in to study the result of anthropologists coming into these communities. <laughs> I am telling you, this is, I am not making this up. <sighs> um, so, you know, uh, it's pretty clear I'm sort of arguing that we need to take a look at some other things. And um, as Henry says, these people aren't really sitting around, around waiting for the next IPCC report to come out to tell them what to do and how to adapt. Um, but you know, over the last decade, we have justifiably called attention to the human impacts of climate change, specifically here in Alaska with these stories. Um, but there's still no federal or state government agency with a mandate for funding to relocate these communities. Um, there's no real government framework to address what they call slow moving disasters. Um, it's undeniably an important story. It's absolutely worthy of attention, but it's also important how that story is told. And if the predominant narrative is of an environmental tragedy involving people with little hope or ability to respond, Americans are tuning out. Um, frame analysis, learn all about that, uh, is used to look at the content and impact of stories and um, early days of McCarvick, where this community is moving. Um, Newtok's decision to move was as early as 1994. Um, its efforts and progress, it's been largely framed out by the national media. Um, relocation required all kinds of money. Um, and more importantly, navigating a huge bureaucratic morass, um, but they have been working toward it, and it's worth reporting. Um, they've worked with uh, everybody from the Fish and Wildlife Service to the Fairbanks Lions Club to Harvard Law School, and McTarvick actually is taking shape. It's been slow. There's been corruption. There's been all kinds of stuff, as there are as things that happen in communities all across the country. Uh, and the process is painfully incremental, um, but it's a process that's worth documenting for the same reason so many media outlets sent correspondence to Newtok in the first place. While the media represents Newtok's predicament as a harbinger of climate change impacts, Newtok's response, which includes both failures and successes, might actually serve as a model not only for other communities in the region, but coastal and island communities facing the same challenges in the rest of the country and world, Micronesia. Uh, 
the story of communities facing coastal erosion in Alaska, the US and worldwide fits into a much larger pattern of news coverage of climate change. The threat to humans, polar bears, entire ecosystems is being told on a daily basis. Um, a prominent psychologist at the Center for Climate Strategy um, in Norway and a Green Party politician, he's coined the term apocalypse fatigue. I'm sure some of you have heard of it to describe how people tire of constant threats that challenge their daily life. And um, as a defense mechanism, they don't take them seriously or avoid them. If that's true, then the repetition of this narrow narrative uh, of new talk writ large may not even be that compelling. So if the role of the journalist is to seek the truth and report it so that citizens will be informed and effective, reporting just the doom and gloom about climate change is insufficient. Um, there's a movement, uh, it's called Solutions Journalism, and it's often dismissed outright by traditional journalists, myself included, as feel-good news or as advocacy. And the co-founder of this uh, organization called Solutions Journalism Network, which he says trains journalists to report what's missing in today's news, says it's not enough to know what's broken. The people know, need to know how problems could be or are being fixed. This doesn't mean filling the hope gap with hopeful stories. It just means allocating appropriate attention to stories of constructive problem solving, stories that are important and compelling but often neglected. When too many people are aware of a problem but they don't have a sense of what can be done, it leads them to opt out. And that's not good for democracy. By showing that something is working in one place, it takes away the excuses for failure elsewhere and increases the pressure on public officials. In the context of climate change reporting, um, this guy says, Bornstein is his name, he says, he feels like journalists keep adding the word really to the same story as, it's really bad. It's really, really bad. It's really, really, really bad, which eventually doesn't resonate because people don't want to hear the same dire warning over and over again. People need on-ramps for difficult, threatening issues. Um, so showing them, here are companies making changes that keep profits but reduce the overall emissions footprint, or here's a new kind of financing for renewables, or here is a place where people under threat have managed to stay on the land and maintain their character and culture. You're just telling the story of what human beings are doing right now around climate at this point in history. Problem solving, just practical, replicable uh, examples of what people, businesses, and governments are doing to tackle climate change. And they're all, these stories are out there. They are definitely out there. News coverage that includes res responses to climate change as opposed to documenting and dramatizing the impact provides what Bornstein says is a more complete view of society. It also gives people the ability to imagine their own responses, to see themselves as part of a solution or even as agents of change. Not like, oh, I hear this story, no, I'm gonna go do that myself. I'm gonna go you know, help relocate a community, but, oh, that's kind of inspiring. That's, that's interesting, maybe I'll think about that a little bit more, as opposed to, you know, what's on Hulu tonight. Um, in closing, as I said, I went to the North Pole twice, 10 years apart, and here's what it looked like on my first trip. It's an amazing place. Um, um, and 10 years later, the same month, uh, it looked like that more, and camp broke up underneath us. I'm not a climate scientist at all, um, but I, it, it affected me deeply. And researching this paper uh, was kind of my own response to this troubling sense I've had over the few years um, reporting on lives of people in rural Alaska and the Arctic at large. Um, no matter how much I tell myself the cliches that I'm shining a much needed light and bearing witness and seeking the truth, honestly, at times it has felt and I consider myself a pretty caring person, um, exploitative. And um, as climate change continues to transform this place uh, where we all live and work um, and pushes these communities to the front and center on a national and international stage, I really felt and still do feel compelled to kind of reconsider my role as a journalist. Um, I'm gonna wrap this up um, so we can have some questions. Um, if we journalists have self-corrected for false balance in climate change reporting, which we did, um, the challenge now may be to self-correct from a steady drip of catastrophic visions. 
New Talk is eventually moving to McTarvick. It's not fast. There have been huge setbacks, as I say. There's been corruption. There's been different tribal councils, huge obstacles. But this community, threatened by climate change, is struggling to adapt. One grant, one innovative idea, and one barge load at a time. And the people of New Talk and Kivalina and Shish and all these other places in their communities, they're not going to cease to exist. In fact, life just might be a little bit better when they eventually get to higher, more solid ground with fresh water. And I think it's a story worth telling as it unfolds. And it's a story that provides a more complete view, and it's maybe even a story that's inspiring. And that's my pitch. Thanks. And uh, questions, but not hard ones. <laughs> Yay! Yay! So, so you talked about the um, that new school of thought in journalism coming out. Solutions journalism. Solutions journalism. Controversial. Yes. You said personally you weren't. Um, you were a bit dismissive of it. Mm-hmm. But it feels like the tone of this presentation is that we need to focus more to engage the public on solutions. So what would be your balance for that to make it to take it away from the advocacy part, which I understand the issues with that in journalism, to make things a more hopeful narrative while staying in the well with inside the rules of accepted journalism? Yeah, I, I, it's a great question, and I'm pretty much in that. Um, I'm at that point in my career where I, I get to be reflective, and um, I am examining what I've done over the years. And um, I've definitely reported on all the planes crashing and none of the planes landing safely. That's kind of, you know people always say that, right? But it's not it's not to do stories. Um, as I said, it's not to do stories that uh, cheer people up. Um, it's taking a look at the kind of stories I'm doing or were doing and following up and telling um, not just the initial story of the impact, but what people are doing about it and responses. And I think we just don't do that because we are afraid that it looks like picking a winner. For some reason, um, if I do a story about a community, um, so a bunch of communities get hit by a tornado. And I go to one, and I do a story on that. That's OK, right? I'm telling it's, it's emblematic of everything that's happened. But if I do a story about a community that's doing something about um, you know, their diesel consumption, it looks like I'm, and they've, they've, you know, it's a, a rural community, and they have switched to wind diesel, and they got grants together. If I do that story, it looks like I'm advocating for wind diesel generation or, or a, a particular solution. And again, I think it's because we, ha we haven't galvanized about you know, what the, the best solutions are at this point. But why not? Why can't I do that story? Why shouldn't I do it? And why aren't I? And I'm asking myself those questions. And I just, I mean, I, I'm not on, a, I, I don't mean to be so earnest and up on a soapbox, but I'm asking my students these questions. Um, why not do those stories? Because they feel preachy and, and they feel, I, I just, I, I, that's why I'm examining this because I, I think a lot, and I've had a lot of conversations with my colleagues about this. We do that. We, we, it's, it's easier, it's more compelling, um, and it's what we've always done. And I, I don't necessarily think that's, um, that's good. I think we just need to be telling a bigger story, a, a more complete story. I know, I sound so Pollyanna, and I, I know, I know. Uh-oh. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm sorry I kept looking at you, but you had this kind face. So I kept <laughs> <laughs> you always pick somebody in the crowd, right? You're like. Um, about the advocacy, I think it reminds me a little bit of uh, talking to people that were in South America in the 70s who were in guerrilla groups. And the, the question was always, how can you, you know, take up arms against the state? And they're always, how can you become violent? And they said, the state is already violent. And so that was their rationale. And it reminds me a little bit of feeling like you feeling like you're advocating for 
some little heat pump program or something like that, when in reality there is an advocacy for huge fossil fuel consumption every single day because when you read Forbes magazine, it's all about how great this company is doing and they're finding new, you know, U.S. is energy self-sufficient now. And that is, that's the overwhelming reality of the media. And so the fact that you'd feel like just by interspersing some reality into this, like, hey, yeah, Exxon's doing great, but they're killing the planet, which should be, which would, should be balanced in every single story that's told. It seems like you're not really, you're just bringing in reality. You're bringing in balance when you talk about all these other ways of approaching it. So. I agree, and but I have to remind myself that. Do you know what I mean? I have to tell myself that that it's okay to t- it's okay to tell that story. I think local, for some reason, local reporters do it better because they um, they're they're less afraid to do. Um, hey, this is working story. Um, I'm not sure why, um, but you know, at the national level, the only reason they sent me to New Talk and I was living in D.C. at the time was because it looked bad. And hey, go do the bad story, Arnold. You know, you know, you know. What it's like up there go go do it and you know they didn't want a story about the move to mctarvick they just wanted you know they wanted um people saying that they were going to lose their culture sorry npr clunk oops i'm losing everything and you can ask me about anything else too you don't have to ask me about this um when you, when you talked about um, national stories doing broad stories, you know, I think back to the local stories we hear about, you know, Kodiak being on renewable resources, 90, 95%. I think Me- the state of New Mexico, their legislature just passed the goal to be uh, as renewable as a 95% or something like that in 2045. But what you hear on the national news is the Norwegian experience, the um, the Swedish experience of, of going there all the time. You never hear on the national news about what small states or small communities are doing in the U.S. And I wonder if it's to avoid the advocacy, they have to report on something international as opposed to reporting on something national. And I was just curious if that sort of fits some of your experience. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, I, I went I went way away when you were, and I was thinking about the the kid from Finland and how um, Finland just won the happiness, or, you know, the most happy whatever. And like I thought, oh, so if we if we ever won that, would we do stories about that, or do we just <laughs> we just like to say we're we're like tenth or something? Like that. <laughs> no, but re, uh, responding to that, um, I, you know, I I would ask my uh, yes. Uh, so if I, I can't imagine, and, and I don't want to blame editors, although I love to blame editors, um, but you have an editorial meeting and ideas get thrown around the room and there's always uh, editorial bias. And by that I mean, um, well, let's do, you know, it's at NPR and the editorial meeting is in Washington and there's been a big storm. Well, guess what? You know, that's the story. You know, it, it happened to me on my way to work. I saw all these trees down. And so there is sort of like an East Coast bias when the editorial meetings are in the east and at the same editorial meeting someone might say wow there's this amazing program in colorado blah 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 it's kind of smacks of advocacy oh yay cheer let's do it right but there's a way to do it you you look at that program is it working what's the context are other places what are the obstacles are other places doing it there's a way to do it that isn't a cheerleading story um there's a way to uh, provide a much larger context as solutions journalism people. They do a lot of stuff on hospitals because they go somewhere in some hospital. They might they must be doing it right. They must be having some great. Um, uh, their record must be great. You know uh, what, what do you get when you go to the hospital and it's really bad? So, 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 I'm not a medical right. And that's what they did. They said someplace they 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 must really be taking care of this and we're going to go there and we're going to do that story but we're going to do that story in the context of that it's a problem everywhere else i mean here's a great idea and we're going to follow up and we're going to track it but you know that's the kind of journalism i'm talking about not yay (laughs) you know does that answer your question sort of but maybe you're right 
this is more of a comment than a question, but since you've been to Harvard and learned the F word, <laughs> framing, um, part of the problem may simply be how you're labeling it. A solution is an outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted to call it uh, problem-solving journalism, because you mentioned problem-solving, sure. it's about the process. And if you're reporting on a process, you can compare processes. And anybody who solves problems know you never get 100% solution out of it. Right. There are always problems that result. But it would allow you to do a lot of comparison reporting, but it also requires a long-term commitment to the process that a lot of news organizations are not willing to make, especially with the, yeah, with the staff sizes the way they are. But, but you might just think about, I don't want to report about the outcome, but I want to report about this process of trying to deal with these problems that are forced upon communities. Uh, and maybe if you change the name, you can do it. Responses, <laughs> yeah, responses, responses journalism or something like that. And that's not to say it's not happening. Mm -hmm. um, and you said something that kind of, uh, there's a lot of people that say, well, you know, nowadays newsrooms, they don't have enough people and they don't have enough money and, you know, and all that's true. But I would say more so than whenever I, you know, way, way back when, um, there are opportunities for journalists uh, that aren't with legacy organizations. There's Undertold Stories Project. There's money out there for enterprise reporting. There's a lot more of that than there ever was. Any more easy questions? This is more of a remark than a question. Good. Uh, I've been very conscious about uh, what I'm doing in my personal life to uh, minimize uh, the impact on our environment. And I'm going, even if I, it means spending a, another dollar or two, trying to, uh, I was thinking, um, how many millions of people on this planet are pouring gallons of bleach into our oceans every year? Um, the Great Barrier Reef is literally dissolving. And um, so it's like fragrant-free, dye-free, uh, plant-based, the, the least uh, damaging uh, cleansing products I can uh, use. You know, and, and think about it yourselves. H how many times you see the newspaper and there's like a story about, okay, Great Barrier Reef is, is you know, going away or whatever. And then you see another story that says uh, fastest growing job in America is a solar, uh, solar panel installer. Which story do you read? <laughs> I read the solar panels. I don't know about you, but I, I do. Uh-oh. No, I'm not. I mean, uh, I think the most important thing that you mentioned, or no, let's say the uh, the the thing that stuck out is the value of follow-ups. And follow-ups are when you bring in more information, you, you have more context, and, and you uh, have better insight of, of what wasn't really addressed the first time your editor sent you out there and, and had a stereotypical ideas of what you'd find. But uh, so, and that's the power of local reporting because you're familiar and you know the players and you know the situation. Could you give us some context on um, how many houses are at stake, how many houses have actually, I mean, of the community of its progress here, is this one house out of how many that's successfully done this? And what are the resources it took to, to relocate this one? Right, so you want me to answer those questions? If you could. Well, I could tell you this, um, but it's changing. Um, this was this this is a prototype from Fairbanks. This is the cold climate housing center, which is a great you know I mean and so this is an incredibly efficient house University that Park. right um, and cheaply built. Um, but what I I kind of skipped this part because I thought you, your eyes would glaze over. But the specifics um, right now where we are with McTarvick. Uh, is anybody here an expert on it? No? I was kind of afraid there was somebody here who was going to be an expert. Uh, I'm looking through my notes here. Um, but I can sort of off the top of my head talk to you about it. So um, at least uh, I want to say, yeah. Where are we? Um, so, so uh, and McTarvick also means um, place to get water. Do you know that? Yeah, because the water in Newtok is horrible. And there's a freshwater spring in McTarvick. In fact, the people used to always go to McTarvick 
on their way home from hunting and fishing to get water. So now, so now there are at least, uh, I think, a dozen houses that have been built. Um, and then uh, somebody uh, was driving home in Anchorage and saw all these military barracks that were kind of abandoned and that they were going to destroy and then figured out how to uh, um, renovate those barracks and they're going to put them on barges and bring them and they're also going up. So I think by the end of like this summer, there should be like 30 houses. And the other thing that's really important is that the community themselves, New Talk, have been so much a part of this. They've redesigned, you know, it's not your typical... Uh, rural community. It's uh, it's it's in a circle. Um, they figured out better ways for, wow, sewage and and water. You know, which a lot of rural communities don't have still. Um, so the it's completely laborious, um, and it's been really hard, but it's doable. And I think just you know maybe Kivalina doesn't say we're going to do the exact same thing, but maybe Kivalina says, okay, it's doable, like. And, and who did you talk to about this? That's kind of what I'm saying. But I totally agree with you with the follow-ups. Um, and I think that also uh, helps with the, um, the advocacy thing because it, you're following up and saying, okay, so it worked. Is it still working? Or what have been the problems since we did that story? In fact, follow-up stories are the greatest. You always get great stuff when you do follow if, when your editor lets you go and do the follow-up. That was Elizabeth Arnold speaking on gloom and doom, the media's role in public disengagement on climate change. Her talk was recorded on Friday, March 29, 2019 at UAS in Juneau as part of the 2019 Juneau World Affairs Forum, Modern Journalism, the Role of News Media in a Changing World, produced by KTOO and the Juneau World Affairs Council in partnership with the University of Alaska Southeast with support from AELNP, Core Alaska Kensington Mine, Dreamhost.com, Hate and Associates, Sea Alaska, and Wastman and Associates. <laughs> <laughs>